Part 2. The Sacraments Do I regard each Eucharist as an opportunity for thanksgiving? Welcome! Today we will focus on Part 2, The Sacraments. During this presentation, we will learn about the Sacrament of the Eucharist and the Celebration of the Mass. Please join me in prayer. I will say the leader parts and you will say those parts starting with all. We will begin with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. We will now hear the word of God. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray now following our assigned parts, beginning with the parents. I will say both parts, but parents, you join where it says adults, and children, you pray where it says children. We will conclude with the sign of the cross. Almighty God, you have given us the gift of your Son, Jesus, who is present to us in the Eucharist. Help us, Lord, always celebrate and receive you in the Eucharist. Help us remember, Lord, that we are not worthy for you to enter under our roof, but only say the word and our souls shall be healed. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's begin by imagining that you are preparing to set out on a long hike. What food and drink would you bring to sustain you for the journey? Take a few minutes to talk with your family and come up with a short list. You may pause the video. I bet you came up with some great ideas. The truth is, we need food to sustain us physically every day. In a similar way, we need spiritual nourishment for the journey of life. In this part, we will look at how the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, nourish and strengthen us for the journey of life. The sacraments were instituted by Christ. They are his gift to us, the grace we need for our salvation. The central sacrament given to us by Christ is the Eucharist. We're going to devote this presentation on the sacraments to the celebration of the Eucharist at Mass. A good place to begin when talking about the Eucharist is with the Catechism of the Catholic Church an invaluable resource that sums up the beliefs of the Catholic faith in book form. The Catechism uses a very powerful image referring to the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life, that is CCC 1324. A source, of course, is the place from which all things flow. A summit is the highest point toward which we strive. 
In other words, our lives flow from and point toward the Eucharist. Celebrating the Eucharist is the most important thing we do as Catholics. As we venture into our understanding of the celebration of the Eucharist, parents, take a few moments to share your earliest memories of going to Mass. Who was there with you? What did he, she, they teach you about the Mass? What do you want your children to know about the Mass? You may pause the video. I remember going to Mass when I was little with my whole family, my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sister. I also had a little prayer book that I would try to follow along with the Mass. Maybe some of your experiences were similar. Let's delve into the Mass in more detail now and deepen our understanding of this wonderful gift. When we do something important, we prepare ourselves to do it right. The same is true of the Mass. The first thing we do is show up, but we show up in a spectacular manner, in a parade of sorts. Everyone loves a parade. A parade is a spectacle to be watched. But why do we cheer? Because most parades celebrate a victory or mark an important event. We cheer our favorite sports teams with a victory parade when they win a championship. We also commemorate great achievements of the past or celebrate holidays like Thanksgiving with parades. So what does that have to do with the opening procession at Mass? In essence, the opening procession is a holy parade, a victory march. We may not all get to walk in the procession, but by virtue of our presence, our attention, and our participation in the triumphant song that accompanies the procession, we each get to be part of this march to victory. Just as a trophy is hoisted for all to see when a city hosts a victory parade, the cross stands as our trophy, God's trophy, symbolizing his victory over sin and death. At the Eucharist, we celebrate the greatest victory possible, a victory that only God can achieve, the defeat of sin and death. Have you ever had to wear a hospital gown? It's a humbling experience but it can also be a healthy one. With all pretense removed, our true self is revealed and we become vulnerable. In the same way, grace is only possible when we are humble and vulnerable. When we come face to face with God's overwhelming mercy at the beginning of Mass, we are humbled. This humility is key to our ability to truly celebrate the Eucharist because we become open to grace when we are vulnerable. And so, in the penitential act, we humble ourselves as we pray, I confess to Almighty God. We are basically turning to one another, removing all pretense and admitting that we are sinners. Some people love the spotlight. They love to be the center of attention and receive glory. Actors, celebrities, politicians, athletes, many seek the spotlight so they can be glorified by adoring fans. When we sing the Gloria at Mass, we shift the spotlight off ourselves and onto God where it belongs. We proclaim, you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. In the Gloria, we sing the words that the angels sang on that first Christmas. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. After the opening prayer, or collect, our introductory rites are over. We are seated and are called to focus our attention. The Liturgy of the Word is the first main part of the Mass 
in which we consider what God's word means for us today because it is his living word. It is God speaking to us now. It is God calling us to respond to him now. In the liturgy of the word, the first reading is usually from the Old Testament. We respond by singing a refrain from the Psalms. The second reading is from the New Testament, usually one of the letters. Finally, we hear the good news of Jesus Christ in the Gospel. Let's look at how the homily helps us apply the scripture readings to our daily lives. Look at the picture inside the circle. I'm sure many of you have seen images like this before. Can you see the duck? Now, look at the picture again. Can you see the rabbit? When we recognize it, we say, oh, and aha, it is right in front of us, hiding in plain sight. That is what a good homily does. It leads us to recognize how the same God who performed great deeds throughout salvation history is present to us, still performing great deeds in our midst. In essence, the homily calls attention to the central meaning of the scripture reading and interprets our life in light of the scripture. Next comes the profession of faith, the creed, what we believe. Listen to this brief make-believe story. A stuntman once thrilled a crowd gathered at the Grand Canyon by riding a unicycle across a tightrope that stretched from one end of the canyon to the other while carrying another person on his shoulders. I don't know if you've ever seen the Grand Canyon, but the expanse from one side to the other is tremendous. After what seemed like an eternity, he and his passenger successfully dismounted on solid ground. The crowd broke into wild applause. The stuntman thanked the crowd and asked, How many of you truly believe that I can do that again? Having just witnessed the amazing stunt, everyone in the crowd raised their hand. The stuntman then mounted his unicycle pointed to his shoulders and asked, all right then, who's next? Now that is trust. When we say I believe in the creed, we are ultimately making a statement of radical trust in God. We are climbing onto his shoulders and saying, I trust you to carry me across the canyons of life. This is what it means for us to say, I believe in one God. We are placing our trust in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in the Church. Having just heard of God's great deeds of salvation in the past, and having been shown how he can be trusted in the present and into the future, we approach God with radical trust and present our needs and prayers. Let's take a moment to think of all the people and causes that we would like to pray for today. You may pause the video. When we find ourselves in need of help, we naturally turn to someone who can come to our aid. When we Catholics face challenges in our lives and come face to face with the realization that we need help, we call on God. We call on him for the needs of the church, the needs of those in positions of leadership, the needs of the oppressed, the needs of the local community, like those who are sick or who have died, and for our personal intentions. In praying for these needs, we realize that we are all responsible for each other. There are many ways we can reach out to people. This Thanksgiving, consider donating to the food bank. Many people are in situations this year that they were not in last year at this time due to the pandemic. We have come to the end of the Liturgy of the Word. 
Now we prepare the altar for the liturgy of the Eucharist. When we are invited to someone's home for a meal, we typically ask if there's something we can bring to show appreciation for their generosity. Likewise, at Mass, we come to the Eucharistic meal asking, Is there anything I can bring? And Jesus responds, Yes, bring everything. The wheat bread and grape wine represent the abundance that God has given us through the work of our hands. In addition, by contributing to the church community, we give back to God part of the abundance he has blessed us with. We offer ourselves to the Lord and his church, knowing that in this meal we will receive Jesus, who offers himself to us. In the Eucharistic prayer, God reveals his presence under the appearance of bread and wine. You may recall a TV commercial in which a boy at a recital peeks out to see an empty seat where his dad should be. Downcast, he takes the stage only to find his dad waving on a tablet screen held by his mom. His dad found a way to be present. More than the father in the commercial wanted to be present to his son, God our Father wants to be present to us in the most personal way. This is why he gave us his only son, Jesus, who in turn is present to us in the Eucharist. During the Eucharistic prayer, we recall how God has always been present to his people. We give thanks and praise and we open our eyes to the very real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Our belief in the real presence of Jesus is at the heart of our understanding of the Eucharist. Although the priest does most of the talking during the Eucharistic prayer, the congregation gets the last word, a great Amen. We now enter into the communion rite with the invitation to pray the Lord's Prayer in which we express our total dependence on God. This prayer of surrender is a necessary step toward receiving Jesus Christ in Holy Communion as we are called to shun any notion of self-righteousness and self-sufficiency and embrace our total dependence on God. Then and only then are we ready to enter into true communion with God and with one another. As Catholics, we don't just hear about or talk about or remember Jesus. We receive Jesus. How many of you take a vitamin of some sort? We are told that certain vitamins are essential to our health. Similarly, when we talk about the Eucharist, we recognize that it is essential food for our soul. This meal expresses our acknowledgement that at our deepest level, we are incapable of sustaining ourselves. We need the bread of life. We come now to the shortest, but certainly not the least important, part of the Mass, the concluding rites, which includes the final blessing. When children accomplish something, they often say, Look, Mommy, or Look, Daddy. They want their parents to look at them and to approve of them. We call that affirmation or approval a blessing. What a gift we receive as we prepare to leave Mass the blessing of our Heavenly Father. We are sent forth with God's blessing and approval. We've done nothing to earn this blessing. It is given as a gift. What we do is open ourselves to it and surrender our own agenda in order to receive this most coveted of all commissions, to go forth as ambassadors for Christ. Finally, we come to the part of the liturgy from which we get the word Mass. The Latin words for the dismissal are Ite Misa Est, 
which means literally, go, you are sent, or go, it is the dismissal. The word mass comes from the Latin word misa, which means sent or dismissed. Having received God's blessing, we are led once again in procession by the cross out into the world to do the work of the gospel in our daily lives. Having celebrated the Mass, we now go forth to live the Mass. In many ways, the exit sign in a church building is every bit as much a sacramental as are the stained glass windows and statues. Indeed, we have come to the last words of the Mass, and we, the Assembly, once again get the last words, four short but powerful words that summarize how we feel about being sent forth to live the Mass as ambassadors for Christ. Say it with me. Thanks be to God. To close this presentation, let's join our hearts together to pray the Confidior, a prayer from the Mass. We strike our breast as a sign of humility and contrition as we say the words, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, and all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening today. It has been my pleasure to be your commentator. I would love your feedback. Send comments to nelson at sjy.org. Our next presentation will be January 10th on Moral Life. Thanks again, and may the Lord bless you and keep you all the days of your life.